Uh, Peter, why don't we start with you? Uh, great. Well, so I do have a clever acronym, although it's too long. And in fact, I probably use that by a lot of times just spelling it out. So I direct this thing called CIRCLE at Tufts University. That's the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement. I don't think I even got it right. But anyway, <laughs> it's, it's uh, civicyouth.org on the internet. And we um, study the civic development of young Americans, including those older than uh, high school age, um, including their voting and their volunteering and uh, social studies classes and digital media and all kinds of things like that. And you also, part of your day job is you run something called a college. I don't, I don't run it, although okay. I'm happy to be in it. Okay. Yes, there's a, um, thanks for <laughs> allowing me to mention it. So t Tufts has um, the Jonathan Tisch College of Citizenship and Public Service, which is the only college devoted to that, um, that cause in the country, I think. And uh, it's, it, as I was explaining to Howard just before we walked in, it, it it, it attempts to infuse civic themes into the whole curriculum for all um, tough students, including the professional students. Yeah, so. it, was, it was pretty exciting to hear that all the medical students um, are given a civic reader. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, Tufts is number one in this, so get, That's right. get the competitive juices. That's right. Um, Miriam, who are you and what's your day job? Um, I'm Miriam. Martinez. Um, I work at the MIGFA Challenge. I was a student in the MIGFA Challenge. It's an organization that gets high school students involved in the political process through elections, um, activism, and um, youth policy making. And so I'm glad to be here today. Thank you. And because you're in Chicago, there's a lot going on in the state, in the city, right? Yes, there's definitely, there's always something going on in politics in Chicago, whether it's at the local level, or at the state, at the county, and obviously, um, even though Illinois was already a given, you know, for Obama, um, there were still students getting involved outside, you know, from Chicago, outside of Chicago, um, in Wisconsin, Indiana, and Iowa. And so right now, um, yeah, there's plenty going on with, obviously, with the governor and our new uh, U.S. senator. <laughs> yeah. do, 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 the, do the students know, learn about this kind of just by being there, or is this something you have to bring to their attention? I mean, what's, what's going on in this kind of quasi-national uh, discussion, not Obama, but Blagojevich and Burris? Yeah, of course it goes on. I mean, they hear it all over. Um, and so in the classroom, it's something that um, we work with teachers, through teachers. Um, and so it's part of, you obviously bring it up. And so, um, but students are aware of it. Um, unfortunately, it's kind of a shame, you know, it's for, for, for young people to because the prior governor was also um, a corrupt um, governor. And so, have, you know, people think um, you have someone who's going to probably bring a different, um, a different type of government to, to, your, to your state, and then having the same thing happen again is, is pretty disappointing. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all over the media, definitely, um, and students are, are aware of it. Unfortunately, it's not um, of high interest unless you give them the opportunity to, to learn about it, so. And when you say you were a student in it, tell us what, what that means. Okay, so um, when the MIGPA Challenge started, it was pretty much just elections, getting students, high school students involved in elections, campaign programs. So um, I was a, actually, I campaigned for Blagojevich when I was in high school. <laughs> um, I didn't imagine this is what would have happened. Um, and so um, it was between him and Paul Vallis, and for me, it was, I felt Blagojevich was a better candidate. But um, I got involved because the teacher got me into the program on a day off of school um, just to go see a panel of youth and adults talk about um, the electoral process in Illinois. And if it weren't for that, the way, when I saw two, uh, you know, the, the young people speaking to other adults, I felt like, okay, I want to be one of those students who can actually speak what, you know, my mind about the process to other adults. And even though um, when you're in high school, um, unless you're like, you know, until you turn 18, you can't vote. Um, going to this um, event taught me that I can still be involved in some way, even though I, you know, I wasn't old enough, you know, to vote. And so I did the campaign program, and then we did, we had a program which is now um, Issues to Action, where students um, get involved in their school, they select an issue and do something about it. And violence is a big issue in Chicago, um, has been for a long time, and so at the time, violence was high in, in my school, and so what we did was came up with recommendations on, on how to improve the violence in our school, and that kept me involved. And so it opened many doors for me because I got to meet um, 
they, we, at MICFA, we try to bring young people with people in power, adults in power. And so being able to have access to the principal, being able to have access to um, elected officials was what kept me involved. Because usually you don't get that opportunity as a high school student. And um, through that, I was also able to, um, through MICFA, serve um, with um, the current city clerk in, in Chicago, um, Miguel del Valle, as an intern. And so that also just opens your mind to, you know, what a public official does, but also um, gets you out into a community to learn about the community as well. So now, people who aren't from Illinois probably think that mikva is another um, acronym, oh, right? Yeah. And people who are Jewish think it's a, a, a ritual bath. Yes, we get phone <laughs> calls from people that are like, you no. Know. But, 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 but. <laughs> What, what's, what, who is, who is Mikva? You should tell people. So the Mikva Challenge is named after Abner Mikva. He was um, a congressman. Um, he also served as a appellate court judge. Um, and he was also, um, he served as White House counsel during the Clinton administration. And so the idea of um, starting the Mikva Challenge came about, um, the thought behind it is usually people, um, young people who are in the city don't have that access to get involved. And so the earlier on you get them involved, whether it's through elections or through, you know, just getting them involved, period, um, in, in the process, the chances are they will continue to be involved throughout their lifetime. And so um, the reason Chicago was, was chosen was because um, Abner McVeigh, even though he served um, for, as congressman in the suburbs, he saw that a lot of the young people who, who um, were involved in his campaign were involved because their parents were involved. And that's not necessarily the case in the city, you know. Um, even voting, some of the students we work with, they go out and vote, um, their, their families go out and vote because they push their families to go out and vote, not necessarily because they, they, they want to vote. And so, um, yeah, the, the mikvahs actually felt this was a great, um, a great idea to get young people involved um, early Let on. me ask you one other question, because I'm afraid I'll forget it. But looking back on your experience as a student, was there what we would call a transformational moment where you began to think either differently about yourself or about the, the polity, you know, uh, you know, sort of not just the things that most teenagers think about, presumably most of us thought about, or was it a more gradual kind of thing? Well, the, I think the hook is, you know, you have to get us out there. Um, and the thing about for this may sound really um, crazy, but for one, they provide um, food, and so when you have to wake up early on a day off of school, where they show up, and you know they provide lunch, they provide transportation, and that's key for a lot of students who can't make it to an event. You know, the way to bring people together is through food, of course. And so, um, but seeing other people, other young people get involved was very, very inspirational to me. But my, I think, the moment that changed everything was when I served as an intern with um, Miguel Del Valle. Um, I think seeing. He isn't your typical, um, you won't hear about him, I promise, and I hope um, um, that you won't hear about him in the news eventually about, you know, with the whole thing like Blagojevich, but um, you definitely were able to see how he worked for his community. And for me, like that inspired me to um, eventually, I would like to run for office, you know, later on. Um, and it was because of the work that he mm. did and, and how he was able to bring back resources to his community. Um, and people saw that. I, it wasn't just me, but the people in the community saw that. And so... It just caught my interest and um, and issues as well, like seeing how his he was he's very passionate about education, and so seeing that he he in Springfield he fought for more funding um, in in schools in his district, um, you you're able to see that he's in it for the right reasons and not so much to be your typical politician. And after the break, we're going to ask you about the 20 people who went to the inauguration okay. and what you're going to say to Barack Obama in your elevator speech. But first, a word from... <laughs> I welcome Joe. We've, we've worked Joe Kahn very hard because he gave a, uh, a very fine colloquium with lots of Q&A um, earlier today. And uh, uh, he was also worked hard last week in Irvine, where some of us were at another meeting. So thank you for coming and tell us who you are and what your, your principal day job is. Well, thanks for the opportunity. So um, I am uh, dean of uh, the School of Education at Mills College, um, which is in Oakland, California. Um, and that does take up most of my days. Um, and in addition, I do research on uh, young people's civic and political engagement. Um, how did you get involved in research in that area? 
Um, I think, you know, as it is probably for, for many folks, I think I, I got involved coming out of a set of concerns that schools were focusing a lot on academic priorities, which I'm not against, but as I thought a lot about that, um, I felt like the sort of civic and democratic aspects of, uh, of education were being neglected and wanted to think about ways to talk about that. Uh, more fully and to understand it. And how long have you been working in the area? About 15 years now. Okay. Peter, um, if I read your biography correctly, you're trained as a philosopher. Right. What I admit it. <laughs> yes. Uh, what was your evolution to somebody who was running an empirical study in, in Tampa, Florida, where kids are learning about civics through a game that, that didn't seem to be probably, your orals were probably not on that topic. Right, with actually with being taped and everything, I probably shouldn't talk about how little experience or training I have in empirical research <laughs> because that's all I could do and get paid for. But um, yeah, the trajectory for me was um, moral philosophy in, and political philosophy into um, practical work because I left, gra I finished graduate school and went to work for um, Common Cause lobbying for uh, clean government actually. Which is always there's another growth stock because it's always it's always going to be there. But you should <laughs> say a word about what common cause is because I think it's actually an interesting thing for there's a common cause Massachusetts, but my right. guess is most people here probably don't know it. Right, it's a it's a lobby for um, good good government. Of course, that's a debatable term, but it has a view of it in terms in things like uh, getting large amounts of money out of elections and uh, and more disclosure and so on. So I worked in in Washington for a couple of years, and then was interested in democratic reform and renewal for years and actually came into this education and youth world relatively late. So that's not, I mean, Joe and I know each other very well and we kind of mesh because he comes from education and is interested in democracy and I come from democracy and I'm interested in education for mm -hmm. similar reasons. And l l let me just ask you, Miriam, is the world that they're in close to or fairly far from the world that you're in? I'd say they're or more. Both. <laughs> <laughs> well, I say, I would say both. I think um, in some ways um, there, I come more from like the hands-on, the practical part of this um, area, and so I'm not, a, you know, I don't know much about like the, you know, academia, you know, um, behind or the research, you know, full research on, um, you know, the civic education area. But um, being in Mikva, I think um, I can say that being a student who was who was who has been involved, but also working at an organization who does get. Um, youth involved, civically engaged, I guess you can say. Um, yeah, that's why I say yes and no. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask you and also the other panelists the stay up late at night question. Uh, what sorts of things in your work keep, keep you up at night? Um, oh, my God. Things where you say, I really want to be able to, to make some progress on this. Uh, I'm really, this is, this is difficult. Uh, so. Well, be, working with um, the, the group of students that we work with, um, we're not, sometimes I feel like we sort of have to do two jobs. Um, one, because of the environment that they're raised in. It's not an easy environment to grow up um, in a low income neighborhood um, where you probably don't have your mother or father around um, and you kind of have to fend for yourself. You have The things that the students have to go through to get to school, I think about, um, and that keeps me up, but also how can I keep them involved? How do I make them come back to the next meeting? Um, that, that sort of thing keeps me up. And so that's why we're sort of social, I and mean, we're not professional social workers, but at the same time, we have to find a way to provide that, um, that basic necessity that they have as, as, as just human beings. And so that's, that's mainly one of the things that keeps me up. How do I? But, what, but how do you get people to come back? I mean, um, you said food. But assume, <laughs> presumably that's not the only thing. No, that's not the only thing. But I think one of the things that we provide the students with is um, we empower them. And so when students feel like they don't have a voice within you know, their schools or their communities, we're able to develop them to a point where they feel like, you know, if I keep coming, whether it's um, doing team building activities with other youth, they, they, they find out that there's other youth their age that, um, that have similar interests. And... Our goal is to bring them together, organize them, to you know change whatever issue it is with you know in their school or their community. And so, um, th I mean that's how we bring them together. We we make them feel like they're they're being heard, but also they're doing something. They're being useful. You know, honestly, a lot of young people don't feel like 
they don't have the opportunity, they're not be given the opportunity or have access to power. And so that's... Just a, f a factual question. When you bring the kids together, are these kids from the same school or do you right away begin to work across schools? No, it varies, but we'll bring up, with, depending on what program, but the program that I work with, I work with um, um, the Education Council where the students um, meet with the CEO of Chicago Public Schools and talk about, those students are from different schools throughout the city, so it's a mix. Um, and they meet with him to talk about issues. And then I work also with a, a local, um, with a high school in, in a mainly Puerto Rican community who's gone through, the community itself is going through gentrification, but also because of the changes of um, Renaissance 2010, an initiative um, that, was, um, that came through Arnie Duncan to close down schools, but also um, close down schools who are underperforming and reopen them. And so a lot of students have had to, from other neighborhoods, have had to attend um, Clemente, which is a high school where I'm at. And so um, even though this, that's not really their school for the students who have to come from outside. So in a way, it is a mix of students because that's not their community. Hmm. How about you, Peter? What, 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 what looms large on that night radar screen? Yeah. Well, I generally don't sleep that well, so there's a lot of things. <laughs> but, um, the, um, I, I, the, actually, partly listening to Miriam, I mean, I think... The, one of the biggest concerns that I have is um, the, the, the potentially sometimes strongly negative impact of things that we do that are supposed to be civic education. So we're, my organization and my friends and everything are quite involved in the service, national and community service world. But I'm convinced that um, a lot of low income urban kids are given service experiences which are billed to them as, you know, this is now we're gonna learn citizenship and civics. So we're gonna do the service. And what they're given is jobs like cleaning up stuff is very often, I can say empirically, is what they're asked to do, is to clean up stuff, which is exactly what their parents are paid to do, but in low-wage discriminatory settings. And they're not going to be paid for it because it's citizenship. And I think, you know, they're not going to be paid for it in, in school because it's citizenship. And I th can think of very few things that would be more profound, more effective at alienating someone from democracy for the rest of their lives than that. And there's quite a few things that we do that have that kind of extremely negative Impact. The reason I'm connecting it to you is not because you do it, because but the opposite. Because mm -hmm. the programs that are that are good challenge the kids, and are also there's also the caring involved in the, about the individual kid. But there's a lot of exploitation going on under the name of civic engagement. Well, one of the things that uh, that I, I read today, and it's interesting because Joe spoke about how he doesn't have a blog. <laughs> and I don't have a blog either, but you have a blog, and you blog every day. And you blogged about national service just based on Obama's speech. What were your thoughts about, about that? The well, I mean, last he, so last night, I don't know how many people, raise your hand if you watch. No, um, <laughs> there was a point at which he, he directly plugged the Kennedy Hatch Serve America Act, which actually I think is a great piece of legislation. I, I'm very glad it's going to pass. It would expand the number of um, slots for, mainly for young adults post high school age to do national community service. But it also actually puts a lot of attention on two things that have been under um, att attended to, uh, equity and quality. So uh, there's an effort to channel the money into people who need it most. And because there's a range of community service programs, some of which are highly competitive. I mean, Peace Corps isn't actually covered on this bill, but Peace Corps is the quintessential example. It's harder to get into the Peace Corps than it's a Harvard Law School, supposedly. So, um, so, but this puts a lot more attention on the, the non-college bound young people. And then there's a lot of attention on quality because the way to do this wrong would be to just try to have lots and lots and lots of kids going through some, the motions of something that we call commu community Can service. you talk a bit about the quality issue because I'm sure that's of concern to everybody. Um, what, what, what criteria are applied in deciding whom to support and how to support them that helps quality rather than leads to the kind of um, boomerang effect that when, when people are given things that are demeaning rather than uh, well, enriching. The, the, the way to do it ba badly is by trying to maximize the number of hours served, which is, uh, you know, the state of Maryland, where I was for many years, um, requires 75 hours of service for every kid for high school graduation, and that's what's driving. The, the exam the, what was in my mind was a Baltimore study that we did, and those kids in Baltimore are getting driven into really lousy service. And you could do that, too, with federal funding if you just said that we were going to maximize the number of hours. Um, the way to make it high quality is going to be all the educators in this room are going to know already, but it's to have challenging 
um, educational experiences that are also authentic to the environments. I mean, one of the reasons not to clean up um, a wall in an inner city is because somebody's going to come back and tag it and, and the next day, and the kids know that very well, and that's gonna, they're going to be um, very alienated by that. But if the kids have a role in determining the project, they'll probably come up with something better, although I'm in favor of a dialogue between the kids and the teachers. And I assume there's some, good, there's some, there's some positive examples. Yes, I mean, well, we have make for challenge, but um, there are also positive examples the, you know, that the feds fund in a, lo- a relatively large way, like I think Youth Build, which is headquartered here in this area, and uh, City Year, which is also headquartered here, have high quality, or at least, yeah. yeah. So, other than jet lag, <laughs> which, what keeps you up? Right. Um, well, I guess two, I guess I'd add two things. One, sort of as a person who does research on this, I think one of the big things is sort of a, you know, a, a kind of uh, set of concerns about whether or not anything I'm doing has any relevance because there is always this possibility that, you know, you're interested in something, you study this thing, you write a paper about this thing, and it goes absolutely nowhere and it has no effect. And so I think one of the things that, that I do sometimes lie awake at night wondering about is, okay, how do you better position what you're doing so that it has some legs into influencing something. And that's, uh, that's all, you know, often a challenge, but interesting. But that's one of the big challenges. I think another thing that has been recently uh, felt very important to me is this question, and Peter mentioned it briefly, and obviously the Mikva challenge addresses it directly, is that there's, there's just immense inequality in the set of experiences that public schools provide to kids. And that inequality is, is true across a lot of dimensions, but it's definitely true in terms of civic learning opportunities. So as Peter was saying, the kind of service learning opportunities one gets in more privileged school environments are frequently both more frequent and of far higher quality than the kinds that show up in other systems. And there's many exceptions to that rule on both sides. But, but the norms are that. And so one of the things that I guess I have been thinking a lot about is what are the ways in which we can try to do a better job uh, giving all kids um, both a reasonable amount of exposure to opportunities and exposure to, to decent opportunities. Now, for somebody of, of a certain age, and I qualify, uh, you know, when I heard the phrase civics or civic learning, I thought back to learning about the government, uh, about voting, uh, and uh, something about uh, um, the way that bills get uh, initiated and passed and so on. And I think that's very important to know. Um, Joe, I assume you know something about the extent to which that's done. you also talked today about you know, the effects it has and doesn't have. Um, but help us understand how has that animal called civics or civic education evolved over the last uh, you know, 50 or 75 years in, in this country. And then maybe others may want to pitch in either with a, a different version or maybe a more international perspective. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll take a shot at it. Um, So civic learning goes back all the way to the initial rationales for public education in the U.S. So Horace Mann and Thomas Jefferson and others were very clear that they thought one of the key reasons we needed to have public schools was that we needed to prepare all citizens to be active and engaged and and to be thoughtful uh, and knowledgeable. I mean, a lot of what they were shooting for was literacy skills. It wasn't... um, activity in the sense of grassroots organizing or something, which would have had very little meaning in that era. Um, but as, and as things have moved along, you then got a lot of focus on civic education, um, which was a lot about becoming a citizen and the sort of dealing with you know, the melting pot kinds of questions around immigration. So around the turn of the century, um, really into the pre-World War II era, there was a lot of focus on helping people know what it means to be an American um, and uh, thinking about what that would look like. I think more recently, there's, uh, and this was spurred by what had been a fairly steady decline in all forms of civic participation among young people um, that uh, had sort of declined from the early 70s to hitting the low probably in the mid-90s 
um, where young people were much less likely to vote, but also much less likely to work on community issues, much less likely to say they care about community issues or think it's important that people care, care about that sort of stuff. And uh, that really spurred groups like City Year, which then later inspired AmeriCorps, to think about ways of getting young people actively involved. And it spurred a lot of activity in the K-12 system around things like service learning and about rethinking what would go on in government class. So to a large degree, government classes have always been about how a bill becomes a law in the three branches of government. And frequently, the students have forgotten uh, the stuff they learned early in the, cor in the course before the end of the course, let alone uh, you know, two years later. Um, and I think uh, spurred in part by a whole bunch of different efforts, we've been trying to uh, reframe the focus to be more about getting young people actively engaged, talking about why the issues they're engaged with might be relevant to them or focusing on issues that they say are relevant to them, um, and giving people skills to be effectively engaged. And I think Civic Ed now, at least in rhetoric, is trying to focus more on that, though clearly uh, a lot of, say, high school government courses still look the way they did in 1950. Any so, editing that... Uh, well, I just mentioned one thing. I think I probably learned this from Joe, but one, th one thing is that um, we used to have a course that was very valuable. Well, they, were, they didn't used to do it evaluations the way we do now, but it, was very, it appears to have been a good idea in the mid-20th century, which is gone, and that was the usually called Problems of Democracy, yeah. and that was based on, um, in large part, assigning the newspaper to the students and having them discuss the issues in class, and the decline of that, so that was 40-some percent of students took that in the mid-20th century, and n nobody does really now, and the decline of that is not just a course disappearing, but I think it's the whole emphasis on um, current events discussion, which, according to some accounts, disappeared in the 70s because the issues got too hot or it doesn't fit in No Child Left Behind. There's a lot of reasons, but it's, it's much diminished. It's exactly what you guys do, but you're definitely swimming against the current, would you say? Yeah, I mean, I <laughs> yeah. think um, it was not, it's not typical for a high school student or for your typical government class to be like, okay, well, this weekend we're going to, um, we're going out to Iowa, we're going out to your local, you know, within the, even with the local elections, you're going out and campaigning or after school, we're going to go to the campaign office to campaign for so-and-so. Um, or even just, we're researching um, what are some of the local issues that come up. You know, even something as simple as putting a stoplight outside of a, of, of, a, of a high school. You know, there's research that goes behind it. And so being able to provide the students with, again, like Joe uh, you know, said, the skills to, to know how to you know, do that research, but also to, to speak about it, but um, as well as, when you meet with this person who has the power to bring that, you know, that stoplight to your to your school, um, know how to present it. And those are even though those are some basic speaking writing skills, they need that. And uh, you know that's not typ typical of like learning how a bill is passed. Obviously, we have to teach them how what the process is to get the bill passed. But it goes beyond that. It's more like they're actually doing it. They're trying to get their own issue um, or whatever. Um, that you know you know, passed um, or getting that stoplight at their school um, to actually happen. So we were more about action, getting them to do it, as opposed to just reading about it. Um, I promised the panel that I'd give them a few provocations. The, the Stanley Fish provocation is coming up, but this is, this is the John Gardner provocation. Now, I have the same last name, but we're not related. John Gardner, probably not known to most of you, was a genuine hero of the second half of the 20th century, actually started Common Cause. Started common cause um, and I was lucky enough to know him pretty well toward the end of his life. He started many organizations like this. And he said something which has haunted me. Now, he said this about the year 2000, and he might not say it today. But he said, Howard, there have never been so many young people in America who are doing so many good things. And he had in mind um, you know, City Year and uh, AmeriCorps and probably Teach for America and things like that. He said, but it doesn't add up. He says the reason it doesn't add up is because what they're doing at the best is helping themselves and a few hundred people, maybe even a few thousand people. But meanwhile, legislation is being passed or not being passed, which is affecting millions of people. And John, whom you probably know, Peter, his one regret was he never ran for public office. Mm. He said they have to make, they have to jump the gap from doing good work personally to affecting the political process. So if you were talking with John Gardner, who is no longer mm -hmm. with us, uh, 
What would, how, what, what would you guys say today, 10 years later? I think things have gotten at least somewhat better. They're, they're used to, we used to display a graph which showed voting and volunteering trends for young people, and they, they, there was a big opening up between the two, voting going down and volunteering going up. And volunteering was going up probably for a lot of reasons, but one was that there was a deliberate effort to build structures for volunteering. There was the federal programs that you mentioned, but then it just at high school and neighborhood levels, there was lots of investment in volunteering. But it was very apolitical, and voting, went, voting reached its low point in 1996. But actually, voting has gone up now for, for four consecutive elections. Um, and volunteering has is, is, uh, been flattened in, in this decade, since, since 9-11, when it went up. Um, so I, and that, those are just numbers. But I mean, I feel that there's much more interest in connecting. I mean, in the field, in the sort of little field we work in, there's much more interest in talking about the political edge of, of um, activism and service. And then the, I think the, the generation that's coming up is more political. Miriam, how, what would you say to? What I say to John him. Gardner. Yeah, I say it's more about providing the opportunities to students and providing opportunities to youth. It's not until you're given that opportunity that you actually take it. Um, and I mean, my question is like, do we take our young people for granted, you know, today because of, you know, a lot of, you know, when you think about what, you know, young people don't really care about politics, they're apathetic to what goes on in their communities. I mean, if you don't ask them what is wrong, you know, like what they would like to see changed, you're never going to know exactly what, you know, finding out their interests, going back to like basic community organizing, you have to find their interest and that'll keep them involved as well. And so um, I would probably tell them that we are, I, you know, we are moving forward with that. And, and obviously, like you said, the, the voting trend has increased. That's just one way to get people, you know, to know if people are civically involved, but also, um, but I think John Gardner was also saying something different. What would you say to one of your more thoughtful students who said, you know, I, I understand why politics is important. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if I was very wealthy, I would go into it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as I quipped to you earlier, murderers are less likely to go to jail than our governors of Illinois. Uh, uh, and, you know, you see you know, massive... You know, corruption of one sort or another among leaders in general. Right. Um, and what, what answer would you give to a, a student like that? Yeah, it's really hard to tell a student, you know, politics is, is, is you know, usually Noble. What, yeah. Exactly, yeah. you know, um, especially when you have that example in, in, in our state. Even in the city, at the city level in Chicago, it's, it's, it's changing, but it's still pretty corrupt. Well, one of the things we tell them is if you want to see that change, like, it's really up to you to, you know, do something about it. And so, with MICFA, one of our, you know, our mission is pretty much to create the next generation of civic leaders, but eventually what we would like to do is to see these people who go through the MICFA challenge eventually run for office. Um, but teach them the right, you know, the right way. And so what would I tell a student? I mean, it's just, it's a shame, but I would also tell them that it, you have it in your hands to eventually, you know, run for office, but also get other people to, like, if, you, if there's a problem going on in your community, hold that person accountable. Um, for what it is that you don't approve of going on in your community. And obviously it's not easy, but that's why we have, um, that's why we teach them, you know, how to hold somebody accountable through our programs. And we do have an example of somebody who 20 years ago was a community organizer. Exactly. Right? Obama, and so. we, don't, we don't even make jokes about that anymore. <laughs> Joe, how about you? How, how would you? Well, I think, I guess I think that, you know, as with so many things, John Gardner's right. I think that's one of the key questions to be asking when we're asking, especially around issues of service. So the, the big push in service learning and the kinds of activities he was referring to really got its start under the first George Bush with a rhetoric of points of light. And the rhetoric of points of light was explicitly arguing that if people in communities would volunteer more, government would have to do less, and that would be good. And so service was really framed as an alternative to government and an alternative to politics and policies as ways of solving people's problems. And, and I think in that sense, it was an essentially conservative uh, and problematic strategy, not because doing charity work and volunteerism is bad, because clearly it's, it is frequently noble and valuable, but it's bad if it's understood primarily as an alternative and not a complement to collective action through a democracy. And, and, and I think we still struggle with that within the field. I, I would agree with what, what these folks are saying, that we have made progress in the past 
decade, but we still have legislation, for example, uh, with AmeriCorps, where um, someone funded through AmeriCorps to help their community is forbidden legally from telling a person who to call to get a traffic light fixed because it would be seen as a political act. Um, we have in California, I mean, this, this was sort of the height of craziness, but there's a day now in the California. We, we expect that. Of, of yeah, California, we, we, you know, we try to compete with ourselves to come up with <laughs> these things. But we, we have a day uh, in honor of Cesar Chavez um, that is a day of volunteering. And it literally says in the application to the people working in the schools for small bits of money to do your Cesar Chavez volunteering project, we know that Cesar Chavez did a good bit of work with protests and mobilizing people. You may not ask for funds to support that kind of work, you know, in, in his name. And so it's sort of this bizarre uh, kind of sense. Chavez 22, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. And it, and it really, I mean, I think it, it is this tension between this idea of we're going to have citizens without government and citizens without democracy in a certain sense. So it's not that I don't think we can transcend that divide, but I think there still is a lot of work that needs to be done to keep pushing to make sure we don't get stuck solely with a points of light philosophy. Yeah, that, that's a nice political analysis. Uh, um, we talked about something before the session, and it's uh, certainly very much on many of our minds, uh, and that's partisanship. Um, those people here above a certain age will remember periods where it was much less partisan in this country, um, and where particularly on foreign affairs there was a bipartisan consensus. And uh, now, um, often Democrats and Republicans don't even pray together. They don't eat together. They don't pray together. They don't vote together. Um, people are being trained on both sides of the aisle to be as uh, power-grabbing and as vicious in campaigning, you know, both explicitly and implicitly through screen kinds of language. And I think that causes another um, you know, that's another reason why I think people may not want to become involved in the political life. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts about that. And then um, one of the working titles we had for this session was Beyond the Obama Blip. Um, I mean, the paper tells us that even people who voted for uh, John McCain enthusiastically are currently Obama fans. So he's, got a, he's had, a, if not a policy honeymoon, at least a an affective honeymoon, but that's not going to last forever. So um, as individuals who are deeply involved in, in civic and moral education, um, what, what's the good and the bad and the ugly about, uh, about partisanship? Who wants to take that first? Uh, yeah? I'll jump in. So, so one thing that is very interesting about this recent election is how partisan young people were in their voting. I mean, so I think, and Peter, you would know these stats better, but I think there was a, at least a 30-point spread. 66% voted for Obama. Yeah. So 66% yeah. voted for Obama, which is much different than in prior recent elections, where it was probably under 5% differences between uh, the two Republican and Democratic candidates. So that's very interesting. Um, the... Uh, the other piece I would say in relation to this is, and this isn't my contribution at all, but there's this guy named John Hibbings who wrote a very interesting essay saying we should teach barbarism. And, and what he was arguing was that too many people have a vision of democracy that is sort of people come together and share their thoughts and walk away with consensus. And when they see people not doing that, they get very upset and think, people are corrupt. And what he was trying to say is that in our government classes and in other ways in which we teach about democracy, we have to sort of walk a different line, which makes people aware that a democratic space is a space where people of different views can fight with each other. Um, there should be rules to that interaction or norms that are respectful, but that it's okay that people disagree uh, quite vehemently and push against each other quite vehemently, and it doesn't mean that anybody is bad. And I think 
uh, one of the real questions then, I think, for civic education around this question of partisanship is how do we help people become comfortable with the fact that they, in, in significant ways, disagree with one another and express that and feel okay about expressing that in productive ways? Because I think far too often what happens is people don't do that and you, for the most part, people don't talk with other people who disagree with them about social and political issues. And that's, that's not going to get us, you know, to a better place. And that seems to be reflected even in digital media use. People visit the sites that they feel comfortable with and not the ones that they feel Yeah, there's certainly with. a big concern about that that, yeah. that, that especially as we move to much more niche outlets, that people will do that, you know. Now, you, now, Miriam, you live in a, in a city where there's only one party, but, not, but the state does have two parties. But how, how, about, how does, the issue, does the issue of partisanship come up, and how do you deal with it? Um, I'd say a lot of the students um, say they're, they're Democrats. Um, and we'll, uh, you know, just because I think it's Chicago's flat out like that across the board, but they don't realize um, that the issues, that it's not just about having a title. It's about issues as well. And so... One of the things that we try to teach them is that, like, we present them with two different points of views, and we ask them, which one do you agree with? And some of them turn out to agree with the Republican candidate, you know, and to them it's a shocker, you know, because they're like, you know, I, we're like, you consider yourself a Democrat, but when you look at the issues, you, you can't just say, I'm a Democrat because, you know, there's this idea of Republicans are the wealthy and, you know, Democrats are not. And so it's, it goes beyond that and teaching them, yeah, you have to research your issue before you make your, your, um, you draw a conclusion about, you know, what party you stand on. And so, I mean, we can be, you know, with this past election, it was very hard to get um, students to campaign for John McCain. Um, but there were those who were willing to be open um, about it. Because we do have to have 30% of our, of our, when we do our campaign program, 30% of the students have to be involved in, a, in the Republican campaign. Um, and how, so how, do you, how, do you, how does that happen? How does that happen? Well, one, some we kind of push others um, volunteer on their own because they want to learn about the other side. Or some just get moved by one issue and that's, you know, the can they decide to just stick to, to the other candidate. But it was, it's challenging, but at the same time, I think it's th those that campaign for the, for, the, for the candidate they don't want to campaign for come back with a whole other perspective about the party, but obviously about the, the candidate themselves. And some are kind of mad when they it's come actually, back. It's actually tremendously educational. I've gone to an event for almost 20 years, which is quite Cambridge Democrat type, and Richard Vigory, who invented direct polling, comes to that event. And boy, does he learn a lot. Uh, <laughs> so I think the notion of, of you know, campaigning for the other party, uh, particularly if you're in a place where the, where the election isn't too much in doubt, can be extremely educational. Right. How about... Uh, your, your slant on, on this issue. I guess two, two, two sort of disjointed thoughts. One is millennials, the generation coming up now, is generally thought to have a, a, a sort of a difficulty dealing with, um, with sharp con conflicts, a low partisan identity, a, a desire for consensus. Um, I, think th I think that from a purely political, tactical point of view, Obama played it exactly perfectly. I'm sure he played it from his heart, but he played it exactly perfectly, which is that he actually had pretty strong political points of view, and they were very different from a Republican point of view, but he seemed as if he was trying to minimize the, the uh, sort of unnecessary conflict, and that was probably a perfect, a perfect play. Um, I'm not sure how distinct the millennials really are, because there's the re research by people like Hibbing says that all Americans are pretty uh, um, intolerant of conflict. Um, I guess the other thought is that actually classrooms almost always, well, this came out in what you said, Miriam, um, classrooms almost always have ideological diversity. So our colleague Diana Hess finds this in studies where she even looks at, uh, at um, evangelical Christian private schools. And so you'd think that the kids were all in the same boat but, or, or inner city um, public schools. But actually there's always ideological diversity. And one of the things that really skillful social studies teachers do is activate the differences and then deal with them in a productive way. Very hard for them to do, especially now, because all the models of dealing with disagreement on TV are very poor. And they also didn't take problems of democracy um, because we'd, we'd lost it by the, by the 70s. So they really have, I think, um, professional development for teachers who are trying to do things like activate discussion and then have it be civil and useful is uh, lacking. Um, in 
in public life in recent years or in the media, can any of you think of what you would say were the best examples of um, constructive disagreement? Uh, I mean, we all know that you can turn CNN on or Fox or MSNBC and have you know, people shouting at each other. Um, but are, are, there, are there more positive examples in the, in the media or in the Congress? Or do we have to construct? I mean, universities should be doing a better job than we are. But, 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 uh, <laughs> the lack of an answer is certainly profound, right? <laughs> well, actually, we, I, I, I want to turn this over to the audience soon. I just want to do the Stanley Fish question. But um, there was an issue where we had some real disagreements over the, over the weekend um, in, this, in this meeting which some of us were at about what is, um, what is civic participation consist in. And for some people, it really means involvement in political issues, um, being informed, and knowing how to go about uh, um, gathering information and informing others and maybe trying to change their views. But for other people, anybody who goes to the internet and uh, joins any kind of a fan club and makes a, a contribution is considered civic participation. Now, you could say that's terminological, but it's also an empirical issue we were talking about because the question is, nobody thinks it's the same to join a Harry Potter fan club and to run for Congress, but the question is, there's, is you know, can you go from one to the other or you know, are, are these two different worlds which we'll never meet? Mm -hmm. uh, um, but that was in a room with 10 people. <laughs> so. I, the, the, I want to open this up after the, the Stanley Fish question. Stanley Fish, many of you will know, is a very well-known academic, actually a, an English professor, but he must have gone to law school because he, he I heard a sneer there, because he's, he's taught at law schools and he's very legally oriented. And he blogs for the uh, New York Times and always puts forth things which are very provocative. But one of his strong points of view is educational systems should not touch issues like politics, especially ones where you get into actually discussing pros and cons of political issues that that's not the job of, of teachers and professors. Their job is to teach their subject matter, teach people how to think in terms of that subject matter, and to stay away from you know, the issues of the day, um, partisan kinds of issues, and so on. He's happy to blog about it, but in his classroom he teaches Milton, or at least he says he, he teaches Milton. Um, so I would say that's a, that's a challenge to the general tone of what folks here on the stage do and believe, but what would you say to, to Stanley Fish? Well, he, he definitely wouldn't like what uh, Tufts has as, as its tagline, education for active citizenship, and so that's, I think, what is, that's the fault line, because that's, that's what he doesn't want, is to, t is to sort of take a whole institution and devote it to a cause like that, and I think the concerns have to do with intellectual freedom, that this is, a, this is attempting to change people in some way that's where it should be uh, more respectful of their own f uh, freedom. That and also uh, concerns about a lack of expertise. That you're you're going to be asking the English professors and the art history professors and everybody else and the biologists to turn people into active citizens when they should be sticking to what they do well. Which in part is also um, teaching critical, uh, critical attitudes. And active citizenship tends to be infused with sort of positive attitudes towards the collectivity. And what he wants to teach in Milton is to read the text critically and not be. Swept, swept, overswept by its its rhetoric, um, and you know, I guess part of part of my answer is I'm afraid a little boring because it's a little bit of a compromise. But I actually don't think we should try to rope the whole university into this stuff. I actually think that there's a lot of. I mean, my background's in philosophy. I think there's a lot of philosophy that's pure philosophy and should stay that way. And um, there's an imperialistic edge sometimes to civic engagement. It, it, I don't know at all institutions, but at the ones I've been at, where the ideas that everybody should be doing it. I actually don't think everybody should be doing it, but I don't see why uh, some of us can't. <laughs> now, actually, Stanley Fish was in Chicago for a while. I don't know if you know that. And he sort of deliberately didn't teach at the University of Chicago, which is where you would expect, but at the um, Illinois Chicago Circle, which is a much more of a uh, demotic institution. But uh, if he were to walk into one of your schools and say, you know, this, is, this should not be done here, well, what would you say to him? 
I say too late because um, <laughs> the university, <laughs> the university actually now has um, that's the University of Illinois Chicago, um, and that actually has now a community service component to it. You can actually minor, I think, in in that area, and so and they also have a, a, a school, um, the graduate school, put like public policy, and so that's community, like the community organizing is part of, a, of one of the programs there. Um, but I would say it's important if you want, I mean, how else do you expect to get people out to be, you know, to be involved? And again, like with MICVA, we think that it's important to get young people started earlier. The earlier you get them started, the earlier, the, the better it is for them to, um, the chances are they'll continue to just be engaged. And so um, for those, again, for those who don't have access, the chances are they will not, you know, at all, you know, be, be um, out there um, voting um, on election day or even doing anything about an issue in their community. So, yeah, I would... I, th I think it's a good point. There is a certain patronizing aspect <laughs> in, in, Stan in Stanley Fish because probably most of the people he's dealt with most of his life, as Joe's research has shown, get these things much more <laughs> as part of their home life. Um, but Joe, uh, have you ever tangled with uh, Stanley Fish? We were briefly colleagues, um, but I never had the opportunity to talk with him about that position. I, I mean, I think the short answer would be to say you're wrong. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the longer, or the follow-up might be to say, and certainly I would agree with, with what folks here have been saying, which is it shouldn't be everything. I mean, I don't think, it's not the only purpose of education is to prepare people for democratic citizenship, but it is one of the purposes of education, and that feels appropriate both for a democratic society, it's part of why we pay for public schools, Not learning is not simply a private good, but it's a public good. It's, it's something we educate people so that they will be uh, productive members of the society, and one of their key roles is to be a citizen active in the democracy. I think the other thing is, is from an individual standpoint, that part of certainly when you're working with young people in high school and I think also in college and, and certainly elementary and, and middle school as well, you want to have conversations with people about why what you're learning is relevant. And one of the reasons what you're learning is relevant is that it connects to social issues. So I think there's a lot of ways to make those connections without trying to mobilize them on behalf of a cause that I as a teacher care about. Mm -hmm. But, the, but to acknowledge the importance of the social issues that the content they're studying relates to. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know, has anybody here actually ever studied with Stanley Fish? Uh, the reason I ask is because um, I would be, be surprised if in his teaching those connections didn't come up, right. though he might you know, strive to make them intellectual rather than partisan. But... Is very much in my mind today because the New York Times had a quite prominent article about the teaching of humanities, the demand for which has virtually disappeared. And that should bother Stanley Fish, even though he's near retirement age. Um, but the question is, if you want to do English and philosophy and history, um, and there is almost no demand for it, um, you know, starting by you know, reading Paradise Lost, to, uh, you know, the, the middle verses is not going to be the way to do it. And so it may be important as an entry point as well as uh, uh, mm -hmm. something to come to after you've wrestled with the text. Anyway, we're going to save the Obama ele elevator speech for a little while for now. But the floor is open for questions, and I see at least two mics. Um, so I'll recognize a first question, but then if people would just go behind the mics, uh, then we won't have to rely on my eyesight. Yes, the gentleman over there. Yeah, please. And then other people should just feel free to go to, to either mic. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm not American. I'm Canadian, and so I've quite enjoyed being here over this very interesting time. One of the things I've read recently is what you're trying to do is considered to be, liberally, to be a liberal bias. How do you respond to that? You mean liberal, in, not in the Canadian Liberal Party. Yeah, not in the Canadians. Uh, By the way, Canadians are Americans. We just passed a rule. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll argue with you on that one. But um, I guess from, from a perspective of more of a left-wing perspective. I mean, I actually worry about that because I, I happen to be liberal. I also think that when I want to go to the liberal meeting or the progressive meeting 
and know that that's what I'm going to. When I go to the civic engagement meeting, I actually want it to be uh, politically neutral, and I think that conservative civic engagement is very valuable, and there's a, quite a bit of it. At the same point when you were talking about the points of light, that was also a point when there were a lot of active young uh, uh, conservatives. And to, for example, want to make government smaller is, is, is an objective that an active citizen can have. And I'm a little worried that our world, which has very few conservatives in it, slides those two things together in ways that, are, that make me uncomfortable. Not that you shouldn't, that any of us shouldn't um, express our own opinions about something like point of, points of light. I just think they, we, we, we sometimes, we, we, we either ought to be an explicitly progressive little movement, which is okay, but then we should say it, or we should um, be interested in active citizenship, in which case I think that multiple perspectives are valuable. But, but let me just ask you, I mean, I use the word the right rather than conservative, but hasn't the right been quite brilliant over the last 25 years in organizing people civically? I mean, the Federalist Society, for example, you know, that's our Supreme Court now. Um, well, so when this gentleman asks for being liberal, it seems to me it's probably more about the way one goes about it rather than, than, than a paucity of, uh, of engagement among people of a conservative stripe. Right, so that's exactly right. But so there's the actual engagement, which a lot of which is conservative, and then there's the kind of discourse about civic engagement in schools and colleges, which is almost all liberals, um, with a few conservatives who we actually prize as participants in, the, in those conversations. So the meta discussion about how we engage young people is mostly is mostly liberal, I think. I don't, I don't know if you guys, either of you, feel differently. I guess I mean I definitely think this is this is certainly a concern because I guess I would similarly say that the purpose should of certainly in a public institution should not be to socialize people to have a particular ideological stand. Um, I think that the thing that gives me perhaps hope about that is that frequently it is true that many of say the faculty at colleges who promote civic ed tend to be more liberal than conservative. They, those commitments tend to drive them to wanting an open conversation and an open discussion. Um, and in fact, I was part of a group um, that was centered uh, at the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, where they brought together about 20 higher ed programs that um, aim to promote political engagement among young people. And uh, one of the findings from the study across those 20 programs, and certainly I, don't, I wouldn't be surprised if every single one of the heads of those programs voted for Obama. That, that wouldn't surprise me at all. But when they studied it, none of the programs had a net effect of moving people one way or another on an ideological spectrum. Right. So I think it's very much possible to prize open dialogue. And in certain sense, the form of democratic values is an ideological stance. But if we're comfortable with that aspect of ideology, I do think it's very possible to have the discussion without turning into a promoting a particular perspective on an issue. Is there any evidence, Joe, more generally about debating and whether debating people who are serious debaters, whether they change their views? I'm not aware of any that says that it moves people one way or another on a left-right spectrum, but I... See, I'm I would have guessed sure. over, you know, sort of 25 years ago that kind of the, the rhetorical ascendancy moved to the right and that in debates people would find themselves, you know, you know mm -hmm. in favor of smaller government and more market kinds of things. I'd be very surprised if that wasn't the case, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know of any research. Now we are in a, you know, <laughs> they've had their turn, so to speak, right. period. Yep. Um, I mean, I, I do know there's a lot of very interesting efforts to bring people into a common space to talk about issues. And you find that when you do that, the partisanship evaporates dramatically. So that people, people when they're face to face with others, are far more capable and comfortable coming to uh, working consensus than when they're isolated from one another. They tend to take far more partisan stands. You wrote a book on deliberative democracy, right? Uh, yeah. So yes, no, I, I agree. I mean, I try to play in that movement a little bit. But the thing that was setting me off a little bit was this idea that um, well, I agree that we that most people in the civic engagement kind of world want there to be an open discussion. But I think that there's so few conservatives in the room that the conservative point of view is um, absentmindedly forgotten. So the, the classic thing will be we go to the soup kitchen and we, we, we help serve the people there. We come back, we discuss, and we need to get to root causes, not just to, um, not just to serve food. So the root causes list comes out, and it never would include something like, well, zoning is driving up the price of housing. 
I'm not, I'm not saying I agree with that, but that would be exactly what you would get as soon as you had a Republican in the room or a Libertarian in the room. They're never in the room, so the, the list is always... And so, and one of the things that bothers me is that I feel like our progressive students who I want to succeed don't get much of a workout. <laughs> okay, we didn't mean to right. uh, deprive you guys, but uh, please. This, this might be related to that discussion. My, my partner founded a grassroots organization here um, working not quite with adolescents, but more 20-somethings, uh, both evangelical and mainline Christians. And what um, she's found in working with uh, with the grassroots issues is, is this is a little bit anecdotal, but I'm curious if this is in any way backed up by data or your experiences, that in working with the evangelicals, she had a harder time getting them to go from a personal commitment to a political commitment for obvious reasons, you know, the focus on evangelical personal change. But then on the flip side, she had a hard time with the, the mainline church goers or, or, you know, quote unquote liberals to get them to articulate things like personal reasons for why they care, whereas they were very able to articulate policy, you know, and what their preferences were at that level. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious in, in I think that's really interesting, but I don't. Yeah, I'd good. like to know more about that. I, I'm reminded of the old joke that the, the liberals like individuals and like the people of the mass, but not the individuals, and the conservatives like the individuals, but not the uh, but not the mass. And, and these are different. Uh, you know, I, I think they're different perspectives. It doesn't quite map onto what you were saying, but it seems to me what you know the panel's been saying is teachers and leaders take on an extra burden when you don't have a rounded set of um, participants. And, you know, if zoning doesn't come up and you're the organizer, that probably, yeah, you should bring it up. Do you want to add anything? Um, I don't know if it directly would answer the question, but I find that um, depending on the issue, some of the, some of our students, like when it comes down to the more, the more religious ones, are when we talk about um, sex ed, they're very, like, they tend to shy away from it. And so that becomes, you know, um, for some, they prefer not to, they, they, they give their standard point of view, but um, it's a little harder to, for them to persuade the other side to, to, to agree with their point of view. So, mm-hmm. so we're having a little, little um, Mike Turner could put on. Do you want to try to bellow? Not to worry, I will project. <laughs> okay. Um, Omar Lopez, School of Education. Okay, thanks. Here we go. I was wondering if you could talk about civil uh, engagement from the lens of adolescent development and the, the ways in which uh, the stage in which that adolescent is in uh, colors their uh, political engagement, apathy, and so on. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, that's a, thank you. That's a great question. I think one of the reasons we think civic education is particularly appropriate in high school is because it is a stage of adolescent development, or it's a stage of development, um, at least according to many. And for me, the sort of Erickson model is the one that, that resonates the most, is a stage where people are trying to figure out where do they fit in in the broader society. They're beginning to have attachments and associations that move beyond their close family and friends and to imagine, who am I going to be in the broader world? And I guess in today's world, adolescence probably extends, I don't know, to maybe 25. But uh, during that period, and for some of us, we're still you know, trying to sneak out of it. But the, during that period, those are really important questions. And so opportunities, for example, one, one of the findings is that exposure to role models, and I think, Miriam, you were talking about this, is a very powerful, has a very powerful impact on young people. And part of it is because seeing someone who does those things gives them a chance to think about whether that's the kind of person they might want to become. And that's a really appropriate question for a 16-year-old to be asking themselves. Yeah, I would have to agree with, with you. Um, it's very, very critical in terms of the who am I. And so um, when, you're, when you're put in, a, in an environment where you don't, again, you don't, um, you're not used to having, you know, you're not used to being civically engaged, um, being able to, again, have the opportunity to, to become um, engaged. And so I think, I mean, on a personal level, if it weren't for MICVA, I probably um, would not be involved or really care about the things that I care about um, 
today or be, you know, be involved with the community organizing um, like I did after, after being involved in mikvah. So it could, it, it could, it plays a critical role, I think, um, learning about it in high school. Yeah, having people of a civic political stripe to admire is very important. Uh, over the last few years with uh, Wendy Fishman's here and, and most recently with Katie Davis, who's here, we've been talking to high school and college students, and I've been shocked, as, as it says in the movie, um, by how reluctant young people are to talk about any political figure whom they admire. Uh, in fact, we, we did this on Sunday, um, and the students were reluctant to talk about anybody public whom they admired, and finally there was a big fight about Bill Gates. Um, the one rule that I had was I couldn't mention Obama because in a sense that would be too easy. But not everybody is going to be able to relate to Obama and he's not going to be around forever. And uh, I think that one of the insightful things about your organization is you get to rub elbows with people whom you might actually admire. Right. Yeah. Okay, James, and then the gentleman over here. Uh, yes, I was wondering, I think one of the reasons... And there, and women are allowed to ask questions too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what you're saying, Howard. <laughs> um, I, I guess that one of the reasons that um, some young people are said to be disengaged from politics may be that they perceive national governments to be powerless in the face of large international challenges like um, huge poverty across the world and, and war and all sorts of other international concerns. And it seems to me that their disengagement with national politics might be a completely logical um, response to that and that they might be looking towards using new technologies uh, towards um, organizing in an extra-governmental way to try and deal with these new problems. So I wonder whether you think that what really needs to happen is that the democratic system needs to change itself to be able to show that it can deal with some of these issues that national governments seem not to be able to make a dent in, if that makes any sense at all. I, I hear that more from European colleagues, because not because it's just because it's more obvious there. I think because the economies are smaller, and also because Europeans do much better on tests about global affairs than our students. So our students, I'm not sure, are aware of <laughs> globalization because they don't they don't do it all well on qu basic questions about global economy and stuff. So they may just not realize it. That doesn't mean that they're not going to be hit by it, though. And there's certainly a, a small group which probably wouldn't show up in surveys, but which is kind of the transnational activists even though they're American. And, and a lot of uh, their power, of course, is consumer power. And I think that's a powerful op op opportunity now. So organizing consumer power across the, across the globe. Um, and there, of course, have been real successes in boycotts and things that have, have worked. So maybe that's just coming to Americans. The one, the one part of the premise that I might dispute is I'm not sure very many American youth are disengaging because they don't think the US government is powerful enough to deal with the issues. They probably should think that, but they, <laughs> they, I don't think they know it. This is an advanced organizer for tomorrow, because as some of you know, we're going to have a panel on globalization tomorrow, uh, actually up, upstairs with uh, some experts. And if you're here, James, you can pop the question to them. Comments from the other panelists? No. Well, I, I guess the only thing I would say is I do hear that from people who are talking about digital media a good bit. And I think that there is some interest in the ways in which sort of networked the fact that so many young people, as well as adults, are so heavily networked through digital media is leading some people to believe that those sets of associations may be as relevant to social and political change as working through formal governments. And I mean, I think on some level that's an empirical thing to weigh, but it certainly is coming into the ideology of, of, of certainly many people thinking about digital media. Very good. Over here, please. Uh, and then, yeah. Yeah, my question is, I come from Mexico, and I remember that I did have civil education in what was ninth grade, and they told us about, like, what the Federal Institute of Elections did, and the laws, and, um, like, the, our human rights guarantees by the Constitution, but they never taught me about paying taxes or, like, um, not having a bunch of debt or how, what the police are supposed to do or not to do, or what can I hold them accountable for. So I was wondering, so what would be the priorities of um, civic education here in the States? Like, what would you want these young people to do? And I guess it's also good for adults to think about what makes me a good citizen 
and how can I form people around me to be a good citizen? So if you had to make a little blurb about this is what makes a good citizen and this is what we're doing in our schools, what would it be? Yeah, Miriam, if one of, if one of your mm. students asked, well, you know, what's, what's the curriculum, so to speak, uh, what would you say? Well, I'd say oh, a good citizen, definitely you have to be aware. Um, I mean, there's only certain ways how you can be, there's, how can I put this? Um, you have to be aware of what's really going on. You have to know um, who your, um, who your, your political leaders are um, in, your, in your community. Um, and I'm not I'm just not polit not just political, but I guess also community leaders, um, because those are the people who can also help you um, bring those you know whatever changes you need to bring in. Um, a good citizen also, I would say you vote. You know you can't um, you know just get involved, but when it comes down to voting for the person you know that, that you know that you're not completely satisfied with who's in power. You have to get out there, and, and, and that's, that's one way to get civically engaged. Lobbying is another way to get civically, you know, to, a good citizen knows how to approach, you know, their, their um, elected official. Um, and so I'd say, you know, just know your issue, know, know who, you're, who, who you have to hold accountable, but also know how to hold them accountable. I'm going to set a ground rule. Each of the panelists have a quick chance to add, and then we're just going to hear from these four other people about a minute each, so we have time for the elevator speech. So, uh, do you want? No, to? I, I'd love to hear from them. I can. Help no. them. Yeah. Okay. So, um, very good, very good question, and uh, certainly that's one of the things we're going to be working on in this school in the years ahead. Is what do we think uh, the hidden and the explicit curriculum in civic and moral education will be? I forget where we were last, but uh, okay. Um, the last thank you. First. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the interesting points I heard at the beginning of this the discussion uh, revolved around the effects of more physical and trivial volunteer work. Uh, that w the effects that some schools are and students at some schools are only offered those opportunities, while other schools, um, some better off schools, are offered more um, important or affecting uh, opportunities and. My question is, how do you get these opportunities to these schools that, say, can only clean up parks and can only clean up their school? How do you get uh, more political or uh, different oriented programs into these schools? And is it for every student at a school? Or is it for every citizen of the community? That's I think the you, you brought up the example, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I don't have such a, I mean, that's what we wrestle with. I mean, the, the, the part of the answer is the really good programs which exist, but they're, and they're, the public investment in those is, is way too small, and we, that may be changing for the better. So I guess one thing I would do is I'd, I'd you know, double the expenditure on that easily, and that's not very hard to do um, because it's very small. Um, but I'm not um, – whether everybody should do it, I don't know. Everybody should have the opportunity to do it, and that would be a tremendously different world than what we live in. We still have to deal with the problem that we always have to deal with in any – social reform and especially in education, which is how do you make, how do you turn some policies about quality into actual quality at the classroom level? It's hard. It's hard for everybody up the chain. Oh, you you want to add something? No, I would yeah. just have to say it's, not, it's definitely not, not for, for everybody um, mm -hmm. just because of different stages or development where people are at is one of the reasons why um, with, with the work that we do. We certainly are very, um, we provide the opportunity, but it's not something that um, the, the school system, um, we have the service learning component where you have to, you need 40 service learning hours to graduate. Um, so, but students sometimes just don't, again, depending on the type of project that is offered to them, some students just, um, it, isn't, it isn't a priority because of the type of opportunity that there is. Please. Um, okay, my question for the undergrads, things are shifting from the core curriculum to a gen ed curriculum. And one of the stated, the stated differences between the core and the gen ed curriculum is a new emphasis on civic engagement mm -hmm. and, um, and, a new and, a, and an emphasis on innovative pedagogies. Um, I'm in a seminar that's working on developing the human rights course that will be taught next year in the gen ed curriculum. And one of the things that we're struggling with is innovative pedagogies to bring in civic engagement. 
what kind of assignments could we give the students, for example, um, that would that would get them, that would encourage them to engage and um, to apply what they're learning without sort of forcing them in any particular direction politically. So this sort of relates to a previous question. And um, I'm just, I'd love your thoughts on that. Well, we've got some professors here. You might mention that some of the things that came out of the Carnegie Foundation study, because that was a study that Joe mentioned, that, but it was a study of about 15 or something um, very innovative professors across the country. Um, yeah. um, so, what, so one way to say it is that it's never a bad idea to have the assignments look as close to what you'd actually want people to do as possible. You know, in other words, as an active citizen, with the exception that they would probably do even more academic thinking about the topic than necessarily all citizens would do. But so, for example, to say we want you to identify an issue, we want you to study it and figure out what you think are causing problems associated with it or possibilities for change, to think out a plan for how you might make a difference, and in some cases to enact something and then reflect on what you did. I mean, it's not that every student could do all those components necessarily, but in many curriculum that kind of thing happens. Um, in, in the Carnegie study, and, um, and we had a program at Mills College called the Institute for Civic Leadership that I will sort of talk about more specifically, but these themes came across in, in many of the uh, programs that were studied. Basically, we tried to give young people a bunch of different opportunities that would all reinforce what we called their civic identity. So we wanted them to meet people who were active. We wanted them to work in organizations that were doing things they cared about, that they could learn about those norms and see themselves as active participants, very much like the internship that Miriam talked about. We wanted them to study and read about social issues, both from social science, but also from the humanities, um, and to think about the different ways in poetry and art and literature that notions of uh, civil society and civic action and social justice have been talked about. So, and, and we very much wanted them to be part of a community, which I think this course could create, where they would see themselves as part of a group that shared these concerns. Because a lot of the ways in which you figure out who you are is you look at the people surrounding you and how they look at you. And if, if you're in that kind of a community, it can really powerfully reinforce uh, yeah. your identity. Yeah, if you don't know the, the work of Ehrlich and Colby, from, yeah. and they have a whole book on... on you know, things that work and don't work in classes uh, out of Carnegie Foundation. Yeah. Okay, last two uh, questions. Uh, Crisp, sir. Um, one of the things that I heard brought up earlier was the, um, the, the idea of youth empowerment and how the role and its importance in youth civic engagement. And from my work with the Massachusetts uh, Ready by 21 Youth Action Plan, was uh, what I found is I surveyed a lot of youth in my city and as far out as Amherst, Massachusetts. And what I found was that everybody, like across the board, felt like their voices weren't being heard. And I, I talked to people who were presidents of clubs, volunteering clubs at high schools, I talked to people who weren't involved, I talked to people who, from like all across. And I found that they were not feeling as though they were heard. They felt like in the school they had a little bit of a say, but then outside of their school, outside of the, their education like institution, they felt no power. So is that, your, is that your question? No, my question would be, how do you feel, how do you feel is the best way to get youth to feel empowered, to feel like they have a voice, so they can, once they reach, once they do get out of high school, get out of college, they can step up and fight for what they believe in and speak up. So that's, um, again, um, our, one of our programs, yeah. that's what we do. Um, going back to what um, Joe said about the curriculum, that's one of our, our, our programs. And so we ask them to identify an issue, but also Research. Another one of the steps that that um, that program entails is doing some research, and having them come up with their own solutions. A lot of times, we don't take advantage of the fact that they're experts in the things that they go through, and so even within their own communities, um, they're not being asked. You know, what do you think is the solution to this problem? And who knows? Like they might. And and, and the the sad thing about it is that as the people who make the decisions don't necessarily know exactly what these young people are going through. And so bringing them, you know, giving them the opportunity to, pro to provide solutions to the problems, I think, is one way to make them feel empowered. And, um, and also having them take, take that beyond. So don't just provide a solution, but what are you willing to do as a young person 
to make that solution a reality. Good. Thank you. Um, last question. Uh, we know that parents are very important in the development of young people. And by the time they're 10 years old, they're pretty much set the values that they learn. Now, would you envision a program where you educate parents how to impart ethical values to their children? Because even if they get involved in politics, you know, politics is very, you know, it's very dirty. So, and even if they do projects, pretty soon they lose interest because they think it's not helping any. Let me reword your, your yeah. question because... Uh, we talked mostly about civic, and you're raising, you're, you're going more into the moral area. But I would like to ask, um, in the spirit of this evening, whether there's anything that any of you are doing with parents which relate to the general sphere of civic participation, or is it mostly just with with students? In mean, one finding that's coming out is that student that things that we do for students affect the parents. Hmm. Um, and including just regular old social studies class, the, parent, the parents are affected by the conversations that the kids have. So I actually um, am not the right person to argue with you because I'm not a psychologist at all, but I'm, I think I would, based on the things I've read, dispute the idea that the kids are all formed at age 10 and, that's, and it's all formed by the parents. It seems like the kids actually have quite a lot of influence on the parents after age 10. Well, especially nowadays in the digital uh, age, a lot of these things have... But I think anybody who is in developmental psychology knows that parents are very important and the early years right. are very important and it's better to have a right start than to have to change things. Yeah. Well, we, we're, we have a 10-story a elevator. It's kind of medium speed, but I would like to cl close by uh, uh, starting with Joe and then Miriam and then Peter, each saying if you had a minute or two with the president on the elevator and you wanted to give him an idea or two which you hoped that would uh, stick, and maybe lead to something, um, what, would you, what would you say? So I'd say that uh, we need to expand our understanding of the education agenda to include a focus on the democratic purposes of education. And we need to do that in one big way by focusing on, just as we focus on inequality of opportunity and inequality of outcomes with respect to math and science and literacy, we also need to pay attention to the inequality and learning opportunities related to civic and political development. And if you said, is there one thing, we, we, won't, we won't mention Mikva because that, but right. is there one thing that he should look at in more detail, uh, either a program or a publication, if he wants to follow it? Because he's that kind of a guy from all we know. Um, I'm a little hesitant to suggest this, but something along the lines of the Teaching American History grants. So I think that there are big pots of money that go out to, uh, I don't know if there may be 100 grants that go out in the country for professional development uh, to different groups around the country. And I think that we could do a similar kind of professional development effort around civic education. Great. Now, you actually know Michelle, is that right? Or no, I've actually <laughs> met, oh, you met, met Barack, yes, um, before he was yeah. uh, presidential timber. Okay. Yeah, and so I would, I would definitely tell him we need to change the way I guess civics is taught or even just our social studies curriculum across the board and make it more engaging and more, um, I, I'm not saying completely shut, you know, close up the, the textbooks, but I think make it more interesting and more engaging for young people um, so that they can, um, so we won't lose them later on as, as, in, as productive citizens, I think. Okay. Peter? Last word. So I wouldn't actually um, be able to say anything because I'd be starstruck and uh, <laughs> tongue tied and stuff. So it would be a lost opportunity. But I think the things to say would inc would include um, some of the things would be uh, change the way we evaluate um, student success uh, or schools so that there's less high stakes uh, testing in a narrow range of areas and more uh, investigation of what opportunities kids are getting and how high quality the opportunities are. Hard to do. Um, a second thing would be make sure that you're really building in lots of opportunities for public participation in the spending of all this money and uh, including mm -hmm. kids in that and treating the money that's spent as actually civic work, including the money that's spent in the private sector. So when people are out there laying fiber optic cables, they're doing citizen's work 
embrace that as part of your agenda, but make it really citizens' work by having them engaged in discussion. By now, I've run out of time. I had other ideas, but the elevator closed. Uh, and he thought I was a lunatic, so. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> so with, with, with without wanting to, me, to end on a partisan note, it is nice to have someone in the White House who might actually understand that. Please join me in thanking our three wonderful panelists. <laughs>